Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we open the word of the Lord and we look to learn the lessons from the book of Judges, chapter 13. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father to clearly reveal to us the different symbols that he would have us to understand so that we may place these more in context for what is important for us to understand today. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, this is indeed a fearful time. There are many around us that have no faith. There are many within the church, the apple of your eye, that have no faith. Help us now, Father, that our faith may be strengthened. Direct us, Father, so that which we say and that which we do will be to your glory. We thank you for this opportunity to come together, to join together in study so that we may come to understand better that which is being symbolized within this chapter and within this book. Direct us now. Help us to understand that which you would have us to know. We need your spirit, for without your spirit, we will not have a clear understanding of that which you would show us. May your angels attend us, attend us each one. Help us now. So that which we learn, that which we, which we discuss, may direct us in the path that you would have us to follow. For this, we thank you. For this, we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So as we were talking yesterday, in Judges 13.10, and the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. So she is admitting that the man has come twice. Okay. Now. As a question, and this is from what was in the chat, uh, could you, Theodore, bring up information off of WhatsApp, please? Yeah, I'm doing that right now. Okay. So I'll have to share my screen there because it's just the diagram of we were, uh, Stephen had asked him to. That you would ask Stephen to prepare, yes. So Stephen could can, it could explain it. Yep. Stephen, can you just give us a rundown on this? I mean, right. Okay. So uh, the top one, if you add up the the times of persecution and the times of judges until the beginning of the Philistine oppression. It's uh, 350 years. And then you have then 40 years of Philistine oppression. And uh, 20 years of that their time, I connect to Samuel, or sorry, Samson. Um, and then, uh, so he's born around that their time when an angel comes to Manoah. He says, though thou detain me, I will not eat of bread. And this year, angel of the Lord is nameless. And so at the start of the, uh, the other line, we have a prophet from Judah, 
you again is Nameless. And he says, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this here place. And there is 350 years until the fulfillment of that uh, uh, prophecy. And then we have 40 years to the beginning of the siege. And that area also can be divided into uh, like two periods, maybe of 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. If you go from 607 to the siege, it's 20 years. 21 years to the destruction of Jerusalem, but 20 years to the siege. Yes. I mean, it's really less than that because you're, but, but in the way that we look at it in a sort of rounded off way, 20 years is, is fine. Mm -hmm. It'd be 587, the siege begins in the spring and the Babylonian captivity begins in the fall. So it's like 19 years and some months, but it's 20 years on the calendar. Yeah, this is pretty interesting. So um, now that 350 years is not literal time, though. That's just adding it up without any overlap. Correct. Yeah. So the actual time would be less than that. I would agree. Yeah. Okay. But but even then, the numbers that are given in the scriptures give us this these symbols. Yes. And that, that's one of the things, you know, when I first started studying all this chronology and, you know, I was trying to be well, very particular about details like this. And, and I came to realize that sometimes even periods of time that uh, maybe aren't literally something, but symbolically something still can count. Just like we can have dates where no events occur, but they still can be symbols because they're part of a structure. And so they, they give witness to, to the dates that we do have. So this is just another witness for 390 years as a symbol. So thanks, Stephen, for that. Everybody understands that? OK. One question that I have. And what I will do is I'll, I'll send this reference back up later. As I was reading this morning in Fourth Spiritual Gifts, it gives reference to a 20-year period during the time when Samuel was the judge mm -hmm. of Israel of this 20 years of, of Philistine oppression. Yeah, there's another 20 years later. Yeah, but it wouldn't be this period of 20. No, I, I agree. I'm just I'm looking at this because additively, as, as Stephen's looking at this, the 390 years would come to an end of Philistine oppression. But we're placing that at this point. At the end of the 20 years of Samson's period as a judge. Yeah, and, and this isn't literal time like we don't have dates here at the beginning. right no I, I i understand that part of it yeah so that 20 years and, th and that's one of the things that i want to sort out when we get there is to deal with uh the history of samuel because it's something that we haven't uh yes. well we haven't sorted out i mean we, we've talked about it stephen has looked at it and i've looked at it but um we don't know exactly where those 20 years are. So we've been trying to figure that out. Okay, now the the one thing that, that also struck me further. In fourth spiritual gifts, roughly about page 108. We are told that the Ark of God was in the Philistines' hands for seven months. Yeah. So I find it interesting that the number seven again comes up, and especially when we're dealing with seven months. Yeah. Yeah, and um, when, because I was trying to work this out, um, and this was, let me see, I have a chart here.
uh, the Ark of the Covenant. So what you're talking about here, I'm going to share my screen again. That's so this, fine. this is um, not uh, not completed, but right. there's two different things. And I've showed this before, the 480 years. Right. And we know that the Ark was in Shiloh for 300 years. Correct. So then there's the seven months, and then there's the 20 years of Samuel. And so if we take this 300 years and we take this all literally, um, this is what works out on the top. But then when we tried to work things out with Stephen's chronology, it didn't line up. So, so that's what we have to figure out. But this would mean that there's this 153 years from uh, the end of the 20 years of Samuel to the laying of the foundation of the temple. And to try to figure this out, how this would work, um, Samuel would be very, very old. Um, so, so we haven't figured this out. We have to figure out how this works. This looks really nice, 307 months, 20 years, 153 years. But uh, whether that's the case or not, um, I don't know. So that's, that's just... Uh, that's another puzzle that uh, we have to look at. But I'm sure we'll, we'll get to Samuel after Judges, so. Okay. Okay, you can share your screen again. But nicely done, nice, nice layout on that, Stephen. It looked good. So Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. We were tying this out yesterday with the promises made to Abraham. The promises made to Jacob, the promises and the instructions given to Moses. So Manoah would have had some understanding that I am is standing before him. <clears throat> and Manoah said, now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child? And what shall be his work is the alternate reading, or how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing, all that I have commanded, let her observe. So the question that was being asked, is this a representation of the health message? Well, it would be a representation of the health message. I mean, the question was whether we literally uh, would not eat anything that was of the vine. Um, and of course, we know that this is talking basically, uh, in, in this case, they're not going to have anything of the vine, whether it's, you know, grapes or raisins or fresh grape juice or any kind of strong drink. So, so this, I mean, it represents the health message. As Seventh-day Adventists, when we uh, are baptized, uh, part of our baptismal vow is abstinence from alcohol. Correct? No disagreement, but the point that I'm making yeah. is symbolic. Yeah, it is symbolic. Yeah, that, and that's the point that I'm making here. So we do have this literal idea about alcohol. But here, this is an example of the health message as a symbol. Okay, but the symbolic portion that I'm referring to, mm -hmm. if we are not to drink wine 
or strong drink, that we are not to partake of any other doctrine. Right. If we are not to eat anything unclean, we are not to partake of that which has not come from God. Mm -hmm. So in a figurative or spiritual manner, this is our spiritual health message. Mm -hmm. So we can take this both literally and figuratively, right? Yeah. yeah, literally, in a sense, it's representing physical health, which is the health message, but also spiritually, the symbols that are here. Uh, in Isaiah 28, for instance, you would see um, where the ministers are basically not following this. They're eating, they're drinking wine, and, and, and that's the doctrines of paganism. Well, here again, another witness for you. Mm -hmm. Over the last 20 odd years, I've had time where I spent time in Adventist churches in this area, but I also had some time that I was spending time in New Mexico. On the strength of two witnesses, I was told very directly that our conferences, whether I'm talking here about the Upper Columbia Conference or if I'm talking in New Mexico about the Texaco Conference, that these conferences are willing to pay their pastors to join a sermon service in order to give their sermons every Sabbath. These are the same sermons that many Sunday keeping churches will use. So tithe money is being used to return to the people that which is unclean. And that which is of a very different doctrine than what we have seen. So at this point, it is for me very frustrating. And has been a reason why I have had great concern of even listening to other pastors within the church. And that is my witness. That is my testimony. Here. You've had the same issue? Yes, I have spoken to one of them, several of them actually, but one of them came, like I was mentioned, like I think I blurted a few things out when he was speaking. And then after the service, he says, you're, you're a historicist, aren't you? And I said, I just want to hear the word of God. Yeah. I just want to get things clear that we are basing whatever we are saying on the foundations of this church. And we left it at that. Well, one of the things that, that I addressed with another church member, I had a, a time where certain members of the church would, would go off they would go for different conferences in different areas. And at this time, this, this conference happened to be over in Seattle. So this one member was not at the church that Sabbath. I listened to the pastor's sermon. I was disquieted. I was not comfortable with what he'd had to say. And the following week, this church member returned. And he looked me straight in the face and he said, wasn't that a fantastic sermon that pastor preached last Sabbath? I looked at him and I said, I don't understand what you mean. You were not here. What is your reasoning for saying that this was a fantastic sermon? And 
his comment to me was very direct. He goes, well, I knew this sermon was given by a Sunday go to meet and pastor. And I knew that our pastor could give it even better than they did. I shook my head. I disagreed with him. And I left the subject alone. But this is what we're seeing. We are seeing pastors at this point that do not wish to make use of the spirit of prophecy. They do not wish to give a straight testimony. They do not wish to give the admonitions direct from the Bible because they are too afraid to offend. Well, Jesus warned us that we're if we're ashamed of him, he'll be a, he will not confess us before his father and the angels. So I would say if you if you're not acting like a Seventh Day Adventist, then what bleep are you doing here? Basically, I, I'd be really upset. You know, in 2015, when I found out about this movement, I decided then, and I've been thinking about it for years, I'm not gonna give any more of my ties to the mainstream because it's just publishing drivel. For the most part, and I was just sick of all the infighting and everything else that was going on. Okay. I thought the church is so corrupt. Like, why would I support it? But Lord, what is the alternative? And when I found the when you found well, when I found people that were actually taking the spirit of prophecy and the Bible seriously and i was finding out things that i had never been taught in the mainstream yep it's a little different now in answer to this petition the angel again appeared and manoah's anxious inquiry was how shall we order the child and how shall we do unto him the previous instruction was repeated so when this instruction is repeated, is that a doubling? Is this the second angel's message as part of this instruction regarding the birth of the child? Uh, so I see it. Okay. Manoah and his wife knew not that the one thus addressing them was Jesus Christ. Let us consider that for a moment. Manoah and his wife were being addressed by Christ, just as Balaam had been addressed by Christ, just as Moses had been addressed by Christ, just as Abraham had been addressed by Christ. This is a monumental, momentous time. They looked upon him as the Lord's messenger, but whether a prophet or an angel, they were at a loss to determine. Wishing to manifest hospitality toward their guests, they entreated him to remain while they should prepare for him a kid. But in their ignorance of his character, they knew not whether to offer it for a burnt offering or to place it before him as food. Christ's character is operative here where they should have fallen down to worship him and offered an offering, a burnt offering, they were confused. What can we say about their confusion? Were they not having to sort out proper worship 
after many years of oppression by the Ammonites and the Philistines. Amen. Then they saw to be taught, and that's what we need to have. Okay. It is a deplorable fact that there is widespread neglect of those precepts of the Bible which have a bearing upon life and health. Many make the subject a matter of jest. They claim that the Lord does not concern himself with such minor manners as our eating and our drinking. They claim that the Lord does not concern himself with tattoos. That the Lord does not concern himself regarding sexual relationships. But the Lord had had no care. If the Lord had had no care for these things, he would not have revealed himself as he did to the wife of Manoah, giving her definite instructions respecting her habits of life and twice enjoining upon her to beware lest she disregard them. Is not this sufficient evidence that the Lord is not indifferent in regard to these matters? and does not look upon them as unimportant. God had important work for the promised child of Manoah to do, and it was to secure for him the qualifications necessary for this work, that the habits of both the mother and the child were to be so carefully regulated. Is this not the same admonition that was given to Elizabeth and her husband prior to the birth of John? Amen. And it also shows that the Lord is telling, telling the husband to cherish the wife and make sure that she follows these instructions. So there's a unity there. There's a blessing in that marriage. And all parents should be seeking the Lord as to how they should be providing for and raising their children. Neither let her drink wine nor strong drink was the angel's instruction for the wife of Manoah, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. They're not just talking about the period where Christ is before them. All that I have commanded gives reference to all that was spoken at Sinai. The child will be affected for good or evil by the habits of the mother. She must herself be controlled by principle and must practice temperance and self-denial if she would seek the welfare of her child. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread, and if thou wilt offering, if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? That when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? 
and the alternate reading would say, seeing it is wonderful. Do you think there's a secret going to be revealed? Well, as was being pointed out yesterday, here we are dealing with Palmoni. We are dealing with the wonderful number of Daniel 8. Mrs. White is stating here that this was Christ. We know from our study in Daniel that Palmoni is Christ. So the secret things are revealed unto the prophet. And in this point, at this time, the secret things are revealed unto his prophets. Much of what we have been learning regarding the three-step testing prophetic message has been because we have been shown on a repeat basis how the numbering and the chronology is according to God's order. Those things in the past have been secret. In the past, they have been removed from those that would claim to be ministers but are not completely serving God. So when we look at this, here is Christ saying unto Manoah, why askest thou thus after my name? In the same vein, in Genesis 32, 29, we are shown, and Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he, Christ, said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. Can an and Paul cried the same thing. Sorry, Dwight. He said, Who art thou, Lord? Like he knew who it was, but I guess he just needed a confirmation. Well, but here is Jacob being blessed can an angel bless you from where do our blessings come god only christ only god can bless you right Jacob had confirmation at that time that he had been wrestling with God. He had been wrestling with Christ. He was asking Christ to reveal his name. Here we are in Isaiah 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Is there any question regarding this from Isaiah as to who is being described. Well, we know that, that this refers to Manasseh's 
of birth. Agreed. Originally, that that because this is quoting, this is Isaiah nine verse six, and we know that this, this is going to be a reference to to Christ. But in the context here, there is this Manasseh becomes a type of Christ. So this goes back to Isaiah chapter seven. Right. So what what they're doing here, um, because okay, this is a long story. But basically, when I was this would have been about 2015 or 2014, maybe 2014. And I was still struggling with uh, the 2520. So even though I had accepted it, it all made sense. The problem that I was having was the dates. And, and particularly 742 BC, right? So we know that we had taken that 742 BC was the first year of Ahaz or his accession year or something like that. And could we place that start of the prophetic mirror in 742 BC? And I'd come to the point where I couldn't reconcile it at all. And so I prayed to God and I said, God, you know, if this isn't true, if I can't prove this, um, you know, I can accept that, you know, the 2520 isn't true and that, you know, it, you know, I, I, I can't prove it. If I can't prove it, um, then, you know, if I can't prove this chronology, if, if it's wrong, then, then I have to accept that. And then um, and that was late at night. And when I, I went to bed, and then while I was asleep, God woke me up, and he said, you need to read Isaiah chapter 7 to uh, 12, I believe it was. Um, so then I got up, and I read through it, and then I saw what I hadn't seen before, and that was that this child that was born uh, was going to be born, uh, and that he was going to be converted when the land was forsaken of both her kings. And so I came to understand that Isaiah chapter 7 was referring to the birth of Manasseh. Now, but it's not just Isaiah chapter 7. You go into chapter 8. It's going to talk about um, Emmanuel, right? So it's going to be talking about what's going to happen with, uh, here, I'll just read um, Isaiah 8, verse 5. And the Lord spake also unto me again, saying, For as much as this people refuseth the waters of Shiloh, and that go softly and rejoice in reason, and Remaliah's son, which is Pekah. Now therefore, behold, the Lord bringeth upon them the waters of the river, strong and many, even the king of Assyria, and all his glory. And he shall come up over all his channels, and go over all his banks. And he shall pass through Judah and shall overflow and go over. He shall stretch, reach even to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings shall fill the breadth of thy land, O Emmanuel. So uh, this is Emmanuel, God with us. So in chapter 9, when it talks about this child that's going to be born, um, this is a prophecy of Christ in 9 verse 6. But it's also connected to Manasseh being a type of Christ. And, and this is still something that, you know, is quite remarkable because Manasseh is the most wicked of the kings of Judah. So, so the question, I guess, would be, how do we tie all of this together? Because right now we're looking at this in the context where we're talking about this Samson. And Samson is a type of the 144,000, correct? Right. But is he really good? Many of his decisions are not. No, he, yeah. I mean, yeah, he, he represents in some ways. Um, what we see in Adventism. But so, in, yeah, so, but yet somehow God uses the weak things of the world to confound the wise. He somehow takes these people that are really disobedient 
He takes a king like Manasseh that's disobedient, and he becomes a type of Christ because he is, in the end, converted. So, so yeah. we be making the application that Samson and Manasseh are both representative of a type of Christ, but they are representative of those that are not fully following in the path that Christ would follow. Right, because we know in the end, the 144,000, they're not, they're not a group of people who were always perfect. And yet they're going to come and demonstrate the salvation that Christ wrought for them upon the cross by his life and by his death and by his resurrection. So they're going to have the character of Christ. They're going to have this experience that it's impossible for man. But it is possible for God to do through man if man cooperates with him. And, and, and to me, this is the whole miracle of the gospel. Not that, you know, a righteous man can keep the law, that God can keep the law, but that God can transform a human heart so that we can be in perfect conformity with his will. And, and that's why I think this is an important point when we look at, at Manasseh, in a sense, he's typifying Christ as Samson is, right? But they are really typifying the work of Christ completed in his people at the end of time. Okay. So, so we know this is about Christ, but it's more than just about Christ. But is this also not giving a reassurance <clears throat> to the 144,000 that even if they have made poor decisions in the past, that they can, through Christ, become purified and made right? Yeah. So, um, so there's something here that I think that would be hard for Adventists to accept. At, at church on Sabbath, because uh, I went to work at church, there was a, a fellow there who'd been raised in Adventist all of his life. His dad was uh, an Adventist school teacher, so he'd been to lots of different Adventist schools all over the place, and. And he was expressing something which was sort of typical because the pastor had done a really good sermon about righteousness by faith. But his interpretation of what the pastor said was quite different. That is, uh, for many Adventists, the words that we have of Scripture, they have redefined them so that when you say something that should be quite clear, they, it's actually not clear to them. You understand what I'm talking about in that context? Right. Right. So he was sort of thinking that the pastor was presenting the idea that we can never become perfect because he was talking about the righteousness of Christ and how Christ imputes and imparts his righteousness to us and so forth. But he didn't understand it. And so he expressed, you know, this idea that basically, well, we're just sinners and we're going to keep sinning sort of until Jesus comes back. And so I said to him, because um, he was talking to someone else, but I said, I don't understand Seventh-day Adventists. And, and I explained how, what I understood about the final generation. He was a little bit taken aback by it. And um, because Adventists really do believe that somehow they're just going to continue sinning and that, that Christ is just going to save us somehow that we're going to get a glorified body and and then we can stop sinning that we can't be perfect and he said something like there's two different definitions of perfection 
And I said, there isn't in the scriptures. There's only one definition. Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And, and that means it's talking about character. We don't get creature perfection. So if you think that perfection means you just get a new body and then you're perfect, well, how can God give you a new body if you have an unchrist like character? How can he give you eternal life if you're not fit for heaven? And how did he respond to this? Well, he, I don't think he was too happy. I mean, he, he tried to be, you know, engage with me, but like he didn't want to have a controversy. I could see that. But I, I don't think he accepted what I said. Okay. Now. So Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously, and Manoah and his wife looked on. Symbolically here, Manoah and his wife present an offering, and now they are observing the actions of Christ. But why is it revealing? What's that? So is he being revealed? I would say that that's part of it. But the thing that, that I've struggled with, whenever we look at, at situations like this, Manoah took a kid with a meat offering. But we're dealing with something that we do not normally see as, quote unquote, meat. Why would the Hebrew represent the kid and the meat offering as being two separate things? Well, meat can mean grain, too. It can mean bread. All right. So when I'm looking at this, when it speaks of the meat offering, they don't separate this word meat in Strong's. Using well, they, yeah, they do. Um, really? Yeah. And it's actually referring to a meal offering. Okay. Um, uh, the Jewish Publication Society translates it that way. So a meat offering doesn't refer to the, the meat, what we would think of as meat. It's the food. So he takes the kid with the meal offering. And the word there is um, the minka. It's, it's, it means literally an apportion to a portion that is bestow or donation. Um, usually bloodless and voluntary sacrificial offering. Okay. But here is Manoah and his wife looking on. They are observing. They are not participating. What can we assess from this? 
what figurative application can we make here? Well, well, first off, I mean, Manoa does do the offering, but now, and, and I think that they should have uh, divided the verse differently. Okay. Um, because the idea here is when they look on, um, it was, right, Haya, uh, they say for it came to pass, but it really means it was, when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, so that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar and Manoah and his wife looked on again they use that word looked on and fell on their faces to the ground so the idea is that he does this offering upon the rock and the angel did wondrously right that's the pala the same as secret and and then well it's a form of that word but then what they see is they see what the angel has done that is, he's going to ascend up to heaven on this flame, right? So this is so this is not something uh, that they expected. So, and to understand what this means too, I haven't figured it out, but this is what they witness when they do this offering. It reminds me of Acts chapter one when the people looking on saw Christ rise and then through the clouds right and also you know we observe like we're we're watching what god does we offer ourselves to him and we watch what he does in our lives and all we can do is give credit to him because it's just so amazing but we know that this must be something symbolic regarding our movement because palmoni is going to rise on this flame symbolically but I'm, I'm not sure what it means okay <clears throat> but the angel of the lord did no more appear to manoah and to his wife then manoah knew that he was an angel of the lord and Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God. But his wife said unto him, if the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burnt offering and a meal or a meat offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would as at this time have told us such things as these. So could we apply this to the experience that we're having now in regard to July 18th and afterwards? Um, because in some ways, this is what we have been saying. You know, why would God have showed us all these things if he wasn't with us? I'm not gonna disagree. Because what Mrs. White wrote further, the angel answered, although thou, thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offering a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. Feeling assured now that his visitor was a prophet, Manoah said, what is thy name? That when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. The answer was, why askest thou after my name, seeing it is secret? Perceiving the divine character of his guest, Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously, and Manoah and his wife looked on. Fire came from the rock and consumed the sacrifice. And as the flame went up toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. There could be no further question as to the character of their visitor. They knew that they had looked upon the Holy One who, veiling his glory in a cloudy pillar, had been the guide and helper of Israel in the desert. 
So this realization comes to them. Amazement, awe, and terror filled Manoah's heart. And he could only exclaim, we shall surely die because we have seen God. But his companion, who was his companion in that solemn hour? His wife. But his companion in that solemn hour possessed more faith than he. My question with what we're dealing with right now, do Manoah and his wife represent the entirety of the movement, including those that are not currently openly, publicly agreeing and accepting July 18th? Well, yes. So, I mean, that was kind of the question is, you know, who does Manoa represent and who does the woman represent? So she must represent uh, the church that is, because she's a woman, but the movement that's going to give birth to Samson. Right. And Samson, of course, is the character of Christ. And, and they have this experience, which is uh, the Mare experience. Right. Okay. So, so they have this experience, and it's going to bring forth this character of Christ. Christ is going to be born in the church. So Manoah must, I mean, it must represent more than just, you know, this little scattered flock that we call this movement. I mean, it must represent... Adventists who are searching the tr for the truth? Well, there are many Adventists that I know that when they were presented with the message of July 18th, mm -hmm. believed that this was not correct because we were not supposed to have a message based upon time. And, and yeah. part of the confusion, of course, was um, the arguments that were being used by people like Parminder for time compared to what I was arguing, because I, I, I agree, and I agreed right from 2018, when we first had time, I wrote an article showing that we cannot predict time, and that what is being given to us is time within this movement, but the events that Ellen White forbids for time setting and that the Bible forbids for time setting are still valid. Where Parminder was arguing that it's no longer valid because we're in a different dispensation. And I didn't accept that argument. But for many to understand that it was time setting within the movement still would have been difficult unless they were in the movement. But even in the movement, people didn't accept that. Well, they, they took Parminder's argument, his position. And there are those that are not familiar at all with Parminder and Tess. Yeah, but they still were. Yeah. But people who were uh, people who believe that we shouldn't time set, you had two options well, in their minds. Either we're transgressing what Ellen White has said. So that means that we've, we're in a different dispensation. And the arguments that Parminder was using uh, were things like, um, you know, no more public evangelism. And he was using a wrong argument for why there was no public evangelism. It had nothing to do with disregarding Ellen White's statements because we were in a different dispensation. It had to do with the work that we were called to do right now, where we were in the line. In a line, we had an internal work to do before we could give a message to the world. That's true on a personal level as well. We see this with Paul when he's converted. Does he be immediately become apostle to the Gentiles? No, he has a work of preparation that he has to do. Right. And, and so this movement was in that line. But Parminder used it as a dispensational argument. We can disregard what Ellen White says because she's writing in a different dispensation. And he, and he didn't quite say it that way at first, but that's what he was implying. 
and he did the same with time setting. But I took the position that we, Ellen White's counsel still stands. We cannot predict those events that she talks about, any promise of special significance. And I was, and I was even uncertain whether we could predict any kind of event other than things like the close of probation for uh, the, the false priests on November 9th or things like that. Um, because those were internal. That's in a sense was part of our line. Um, so it, it had to occur uh, within our line, but only within this movement, not something for the world. And so we can't have a close of probation where Christ stands up and says, let him that is righteous be righteous still in any line other than the line in which he does do that, which is at the close of probation for the world. So, so there was these problems that we had um, that, uh, you know, dealt with, with Adventism. But now we look at this thing here, we're trying to address uh, who Manoah represents. And, and we have either he represents the church at large or he represents uh, the Levites those that are actually seeking for truth but then we have to under, then we have to try to s sort out you know wh who is his wife specifically which i would say that the wife must represent this movement or or a part of this movement that's going to give birth to the character of christ okay and your point specifically, because I probably got off track from your point about the, the ones who didn't. Well, how did you say that again? My point specifically is that there are many in the Adventist church that have not been closely following the movement. Mm -hmm. That accept the fact that Ellen White gave a prediction regarding Nashville. But they either were unaware of it or made recently aware of it just before the prediction of July 18th was being presented. Yeah. Now, now part of the interesting thing regarding that had to do with, um, uh, you know, the release of the letters and manuscripts in 2015. Was that right? And and so. People started searching in, in her writings and finding these more direct statements regarding Nashville. Because they were they were there in the published writings, but uh, there wasn't enough to put them into context to see what she was referring to, at least for most people. So so it's just at that time we start to um, be de developing our understanding that leads us to the Nashville prediction. So these are kind of happening at the same time, which is interesting. Okay. So now, she reminded him that the Lord had been pleased to accept their sacrifice and had a son who should begin to deliver Israel. This was an evidence of favor instead of wrath. Had the Lord purposed to destroy them, he would not have wrought this miracle, nor given them a promise which, were they to perish, must fail of fulfillment. So, prediction is made. There is now a time of preparation before the prophecy is fulfilled. That time of, prop, of preparation is the waiting for the birth of Samson. Would you have a problem with that type of an analogy? Okay, explain it again. Well, they were given a prophecy, right? Mm -hmm. They were given a prophecy of one that would deliver Israel, correct? 
Uh -huh. But does that one that is going to deliver Israel, is, is this deliverer immediately available? No. The deliverer must be prepared. You have a, a time before his birth, and then you've got a time in which he is to be prepared to deliver his people. So does this not represent a time in which we must be prepared in order to give this message. Yeah, there's no doubt um, that this is the time of preparation because the, the everlasting gospel is a three-step testing prophetic message to develop and demonstrate two classes of worshipers. Okay. The words uttered by the angel convey an important truth. Our creator himself declares that the mother's habits prior to the birth of her child will affect its character and destiny. In speaking to this one mother, the Lord spoke to all the anxious, sorrowing mothers of that time and to all the mothers of succeeding generations. Is there any stuttering, any issue with what she has just written here is this not clear that this is a message to the church yes every mother may now understand her duty she may know that the character of her children will depend vastly more upon her own habits before their birth and her personal efforts after their birth than upon external advantages or disadvantages. Within the church, if we are feeding those within the church with the wine of Babylon or with that which is unclean, then how can we expect a church to be prepared to give a message? especially to give a message like a trumpet with a certain sound. Not when there's alcohol involved. Not when there is the wine of Babylon involved, right? Right, right. That's what I mean, yeah. Okay. I don't disagree with you on the alcohol either. Okay. <laughs> because in, in the literal, that, that's, for me, it's a very clear representation. So if the mother is unwilling to give this personal effort, if the mother is unwilling to give up alcohol, if the mother is unwilling to give up cigarettes, if the mother is unwilling for a healthful diet, the child will be born enfeebled. If the church is unwilling to give up the wine of Babylon, if the church is unwilling to study according to Miller's rules rather than those promulgated throughout the world, then how can the trumpet give a certain sound? And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew and the Lord blessed him. So in, in the faith chapter of Hebrews 11, Paul recounts 
And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets. We are also given this that from 1 Samuel. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And then in Luke, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his showing unto Israel, speaking of John. But then in Luke 2, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Samson was given the same opportunity, the same blessings. the same potential course as was given to Samuel, John, and Christ. His parents observed this blessing. They observed the preparation that was going forward, and they knew that their son would deliver Israel from the Philistines. But did he do this from his birth forward? Was there something so miraculous that even as a baby, he was delivering Israel from the Philistines? Did he not need to grow to come to an understanding of the work that would be before him? Yes, it sounds as if he grew through much hardship and heartbreak. So how are we to proceed in giving this message? Have we grown into the stature even of that of Samson at this point? Are we yet prepared as a movement, as a people, to give this message to the church? Now, when I speak of this message, I'm asking about the message of July 18th. And, well, you know, part of the question, giving the message to the church, I mean, I don't know if we fully understand what July 18th is about yet. Isn't that part of our preparation? Yeah. Because one is we have to be able to give a message to the church. And, and people have often, often asked me, well, what are we going to do? We're going to go through all this, this chronology and all these numbers and all these different things that we hardly understand ourselves. And we're going to witness to people with this, this and this is going to bring them in. Um, so I think that there, you know, and as I try to point out, to me, it's the story of Joseph, uh, the story of Ezra, 7 to 10. Um, and, and other things, you know, the, the understanding of the 70 weeks more completely, the understanding of the 2300 days, um, the connection between literal Israel and spiritual Israel that creates these 2520 prophetic mirrors. But mixed in with that is July 18th, because they all pointed to July 18th. But I'm not really sure how this message is to be given specifically. Um, I think part of it, July 18th, was given uh, at least for us to experience Millerite history. And that should have been something that would help us understand um, who we are and when we are. 
but also we have um, uh, you know everything that has to do with our lines that needs to be presented. So I, I'm just not sure how it's going to happen. I mean, I have ideas how it might happen, but for people to become interested in this message at this time, um, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what's going to happen other than, you know, we have to continue following on how God has been leading us. And, and and see what what unfolds but i mean definitely this is a time of preparation we have now come to the close of the verses of judges 13. We are being shown by the translators that they <clears throat> identify 1324 as a separate thought. Now, we're going to go into Judges 14 starting tomorrow. What other thoughts do we need to address within Judges 13? Okay, so one is the name of Samson. Okay. So um, the gematria of his name in English is 81. And what does 81 represent? Well, everything I've ever seen with 81 regarding Mrs. White was that the, con the general conference session she attended when she was 81 was the saddest of her experience. Mm -hmm. But 81 also is the reverse in numerals, numerals of 18. Okay. So we would have a representation here of July 18th. And 81 represents the priests and how so around? I mean, I know, but can you explain it? Um, there was 81 priests, I guess, that at the end of the priesthood in uh, Saul's time. Yeah. Uh, what's, the, what's the reference to that? Do we have the, the verse? In Saul's time, was that the, were, were there 81 priests that Saul slaughtered? Or maybe I'm getting confused. Um, I don't know. How do we approach this? Now in Hebrew, uh, Samson is uh, 696, the gematria, the Hebrew gematria. Okay. So. Yeah, so the 81 priests, I don't know if Stephen remembers where, where, where we find that. I know Jeff presented it many times. Second Chronicles 26, it's Isaiah when he defiled the temple and the 80 priests threw him out, or 81 priests threw him out. Second Chronicles? Yeah. 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 yeah, so there was Azariah the priest went in after him with fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men, and they withstood Uzziah. This is verse uh, 17. Right, so when Isaiah was um, burning incense upon the altar, He went into the temple of the Lord, verse 16, to burn incense upon the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest went in after him, and with him fourscore priests of the Lord that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah 
the king and said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the son of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. God of the sanctuary, for thou hast trans trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was wroth and had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, the leprosy even rose up in his forehead before the priests and the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. So, so this is going to be uh, the 81 priests, the high priest and fourscore other priests. Okay, my, my question would have been incorrect because according to 1 Samuel 22, 18, and Saul said unto Doeg, turn thou and fall upon the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priests and slew on that day fourscore and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. That's 85. Now, in the Vulgate, <clears throat> they show it as 385. So we have, there would be 85 priests and the possibility of 300 members of their family. Okay. So that would not have a relation to 81. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. But could we take this 81 of Samson to be symbolic of Samson, uh, that, he's sim that that story of them going into Uzziah to stop him from burning incense, that that somehow could represents be. this movement? Could be. Any other thoughts? Where did you get the number 81 from in the first place? Second Chronicles chapter 26. Is it 26? Um, 26 verse uh, 16 and onward. So that's Uzziah uh, offering incense. So there's going to be Azariah the priest in verse 17 went in after him and with him four score priests of the Lord that were valiant men. So that's the 81 priests. How was it tied to do study again? Uh, Samson's gematria adds up to 81. Right. Okay. right. So, and, and of course, yeah. it's Palmoni, right? And, and one of the things about uh, these... Um, you know, so gematria is obviously a biblical principle, not used in the way that, uh, you know, it's not magic. We're not doing magic. We're not following numbers as guiding us. But God uses them to illustrate things. So, so the gematria of Samson has significance as a symbol. He, he, the, um, he thought was meant to be like a span. So it's going to be like square. So a span is half a cubit. So if a cubit is 18 inches, half a cubit is nine inches. So um, that would be like nine by nine, which is 81. Okay, interesting. And you, you knew that already? Yes. <laughs> Okay. Anything else?
Any other comment or question regarding what we've covered today? Um, so we're just going back to the name of Palm and I. Um, so, so we have this, um, this name that's secret. So we know this is Palmonai that's going to be talking to, uh, well, first to the woman, right? Because she's going to see him first. But then she's going to tell Manoa, right? And then he's going to ask after the name, and then he's going to be told the name is secret. Now, in Hebrew, Palmoni, uh, the gematria, is 216, which we know is 6 times 6 times 6. Um, and we have uh, then Palmoni is going to give this name Samson, which in English gematria is 81, in Hebrew gematria is 696. Um, and we also have this offering. This offering is this um, what is that offering? I mean, what does it mean when he ascends? I mean, we, we compare it to the second coming, you know, or Christ or that is uh, ascension, that he's going to come back in the same way. Um, I, I, there's still more it to understand. could mean that. It could also mean that Christ combines his merits with our sincere prayers. Yeah, and, and we have also their, their Mare experience. Uh, I mean, so we can see how this fits, but we're going to really have to go over this whole chapter again, I think, and, and discuss it before we go into chapter 14. Or maybe we should just go into chapter 14. Um, but I, I think that we need to look at uh, chapter 13 in more detail. All right. This, I mean, we've gone over it, but it's it's still been a bit scattered. You know, go back and, and just review it one more time before we go to chapter 14. Unless, unless we think that chapter 14 and 15 and 16 are going to give us enough to go back to chapter 13 and understand it better. Well, that, I mean, there's quite a bit to be seen in these next two chapters. Mm -hmm. And there's quite a bit really for us to consider here. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. All right. We'll come back to this. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the symbol of Samson. We thank you for this symbol of the deliverer of Israel and what it means for our time. Help us today, Father as we depart from this meeting. Direct us in the steps that you would have us to take. Help us so that in our paths, we may more properly represent your character and all that you would have done. Direct us now. Prepare us for the work that you would have us to do. Help us so that we may leave our hand in yours through this hand, through this these paths that we must walk so we may be better prepared to give a message that you would want given to this earth in its final closing hours. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen.